pathological reasons to profit in a secret way. This universalized suspicion is typically modern attitude. Okay, let's go on with Antigone. So this is her immediate ethical nature. But Hegel tries to prove that there is already a crack in this edifice that Antigone's universe uh, collapses. How? His point is that this is her starting point of Antigone. The, the, these unwritten eternal laws which are simply here are telling her that a dead person should be properly buried through the ritual and so on and that's her duty. That's what she is. She cannot help it. But once she does the forbidden act, performing the funeral rite for, how do you pronounce it? I pronounce it usually the Greek way, polyneikos. How do you pronounce it? Polynysis, whatever. Okay, I will speak to the Greek way. And confronts the consequences. The threat that she will die while still alive. You know, that she will be excommunicated, buried alive. Only then she becomes aware of the actual rule that guided her. Through the act, she discovers beneath this universality, one has to respect unwritten laws, the particular rule. That's another quote which comes later from Antigone. What law do I appeal to claiming this? And then, this is the famous passage. If my husband died, there would be another one. And if I were to lose a child of mine, I would have another with some other man. But since my father and my mother too are hidden away in Hades' house, I never have another living brother. That was the law I used to honor, and so on. So here, after the fact, she says something very different. It's not just generally unwritten laws, say, which are burned. She said only for the brother. And it's interesting how dramatic this point is. Uh, do you know that there is, if you know the history of interpretations of Antigone, do you know that uh, for a long time one of the uh, either one of the predominant way to get rid of it, for example, Goethe claimed this must have been a later insertion. It cannot be it's so vulgar the idea only for my brother. And uh, uh, now comes a friendly step at my friend enemy. Even Judith Butler, in her book on Antigone, goes into this like it's not only brother, brother. Uh, Everyone is embarrassed by this motive. But for Hegel, that's the whole point. Through the act, she thinks before acting that I'm doing this out of a general principle. When confronted with the true consequences of the act, she becomes aware that no, she wouldn't have done it if another of her relatives or friends would have been left unburied there. It's only for her brother. Why? Now we come to the crucial point, which will bring us to Antigone's uh, limitation. Of course, what you will say is, ho ho, it's incest. Of course, incestuous love. And then you have one maybe good argument to claim it. It's that, okay, maybe it wouldn't have been incest in another family. But fuck it, we are talking about Oedipus family, no? If it's not incest here, then where, where it is? Uh, but I claim, no, I claim that, and this is the genius of Jacques Lacan's interpretation of Antigone in his seminar of ethics, how he never mentions incest. I think we should apply here that wonderful rule by Lévi-Strauss, who claimed, maybe it's false, I don't know, that he discovered Claude Lévi-Strauss, the anthropologist, a tribe which claim that all dreams have sexual meaning, all except sexual dreams. So I claim that precisely because this is Oedipus family where incest was like a practical affair of the day, you cannot uh, persist this into it. Uh, why then, why the brother? Again, and the, the key point is Antigone was able to formulate this insight only after she accomplished her act. Only once she did it, did she become aware of what she did it, of what really, uh, of what really uh, motivated her. So, again, through the act which we pass from abstract universality, respect the dead, they all deserve funeral rights, to this concrete privileged example. Uh, why? Okay, Hegel gives them... Uh, Wonderful reason why, because 
the link to the brother, is it linked to pure otherness? What kind of other is brother? Here we encounter the uh, Hegel's reading. That here we encounter the limitation of Antigone. Brother is, for Antigone, an other deprived of all personal features. Which is why Antigone's did, you know, when she says, it doesn't matter what my brother did. It may all be true what Creon claims. He was a traitor, wanted to destroy our city and so on, but, but he is my brother. So Hegel's point is that that's the limit of this uh, uh, naive ethics, that uh, uh, the respect you pay to another no longer concerns the living but the dead. To love somebody, someone for what he is, not for what he did, is ultimately to love him as a corpse. That is to say, that's for him the inherent limitation, again, or of, antique, of this naive love. That it works only if the other whom you unconditionally love is, is uh, reduced to a dead one. Uh, uh, Okay, here Antigone catastrophically again confronts the limitation and so on and so on. But how that do we pass from this to tragedy? Ah, this is the beauty of Hegel. Hegel's point, and I think he was absolutely right, is that it's not that after the Greek tragedies there comes comedy. Either already in the Greek time, you know how it was usually done, four games, I think, per day, this like, not double bill as in Hollywood when I was young, but quadruple bill. <laughs> uh, that it was, you know, three tragedies and a comedy. Not only in this way, and also not only historically, in the sense that you know that later in Roman times we have comedies. For Hegel, there is a precise point, precisely as a reaction to realizing the deadlock of her love, this mortified dimension, that... Uh, Comical element enters, occurs in Antigone herself. Let me be precise here. How? Hegel noticed something weird happening to Antigone after she pathetically assumes her fate. You know, after she is condemned and she knows she will die, she totally changes. If you look the play attentively, you will even notice that only at that time she becomes beautiful, sublime. Before, she is like a nasty bitch. Remember her <laughs> conversations with Ismene, her sister, how brutal she is towards her and so on. I mean, if there is a so-called warm human being in Antigone, it's Ismene. Antigone is a bitch. I mean, fuck you, I wouldn't like to have Antigone for my sister, if you ask me, no? Because she would celebrate me after I'm dead. <laughs> uh, what she does to cope with her predicament is the Hegel's point. She starts to act. She loses this natural immediacy, I organically do my duty. She displays already a level of self-awareness and reflectivity about her role. Let me give you one of the quotes. Where she says, I've heard about a guest of ours, daughter of Tantalus from Phrygia. She went to an excruciating death in Sipilus, right on the mountain peak. The stone there, just like clinging ivy, wore her down, and now, so people say, the snow and the rain never leave her there as she laments. Below her weeping eyes, her neck is wet with tears. God brings me to a final rest which most resembles hers. Why is this comedy for Hegel? She is already composing poems on herself. You know what she is doing here? It's no longer immediate suffering. It's as if I'm dying and I say, imagine, I'm like a hero and so on. You know what I mean? She is immediately, as it were, mythifying herself. She is using metaphors to designate herself displaying a self-consciously artistic ability involved in playing the role of a character. In other words,